This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of having Celeste Headley, a public radio journalist, top 10 speaker and best-selling author. She's going to learn about our industry and she is going to give us expert advice on how to listen to our members better. So Celeste, welcome to Halo Talks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you want to just give you a quick background. I gave the highlights here. Uh, but how you became an expert and decided to dedicate your life to helping others. So I have been a journalist in public media, NPR, PRI, PBS, for over 20 years. And the, when I very first started out studying communication and conversation, it was because I wanted to get better at what I did. I wanted to be a better interviewer. And you know this, an interview is just basically a formal conversation with other rules. <laughs> Um, so I started reading the research on uh, how to have better conversations, and then I was able to go in and, and try that stuff out. You know, when they told you to maintain eye contact, I could go back to my studio and try that for a couple weeks and see if it improved conversations. And what I found was that the advice we'd been getting for a really long time was terrible, and it was not effective. Um, and basically what I discovered was that based, in order to get that advice, what they did was they, they watched people having good conversations and they said, oh, when people are having a good conversation, they nod their head and they say, uh-huh. And they gesture and they maintain eye contact. So if you do all those things, you'll have a good conversation, <laughs> but it, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I had to start from scratch. Gotcha. So in our industry, health clubs, boutique studios, uh, I've gotten hammered by the pandemic. A lot of members have left. Either they're they're afraid to go in, which rightfully so. Uh, in certain instances, if you've got underlying conditions or you're a certain age, it's probably not a good idea to go ahead and socialize until you you have the vaccine. Um, but I think one of the the issues in our industry has been communication. One, it's been messaging. You know why you should come to a health club or why you should care about your health or why you should join our community, and, and also once someone is a member, how we actually continue to communicate with them real time. And I find that a lot of people use the data and just run reports and forgot that they actually have people walking physically into their location and they can have a conversation with them. Um, and they use technology almost as a default to say, oh yeah, I do communicate with my members. Um, and, and I say, you know, you can look at the data, but trust your gut and also talk to people. So I want to get your your viewpoint on that and have a debate while I'm not multitasking and I'm solely listening to your advice. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in what you just said. So let me try to pick it apart. Sure. Um, the first thing is this trust that we have in technology. There is an, an assumption in all kinds of industries that uh, digitally mediated communication is more efficient. Um, email is more efficient. It takes less time, we think. We think that texting is more is is more efficient and more clear, less prone to miscommunications. We are, have these fears that if we get on the phone with somebody, it, we're going to be stuck there, you know, for 20, 30 minutes. All of this stuff has been tested. I can't even tell you how many times we have taken mm -hmm. all of these assumptions into the lab and they're all wrong. A. Email is not faster than the phone conversation. We have tested that over and over and over again. B, um, email is actually more prone to miscommunication than phone conversations. In fact, uh, the number one cause for project failure among businesses is, is miscommunication. The number one cause of miscommunication is overuse of email. Um, and finally, email, uh, we know, you know, email's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and it actually makes people more prone to irritation. They are more likely to escalate conflict. They're less likely to be cooperative. They're not going to answer your questions if you're sending out surveys to your um, members by email. So all of those assumptions that you make that make you avoid that conversation are just factually wrong. Now, you said, I want you to trust your gut. I say, please don't trust your gut. And the reason I say this is because 15 years of research has shown me that our guts are, are wrong all the time. Um, we like to think as human beings that we're quite logical, that we're reasonable, but we're really not. We're quite emotional. And your gut, because your gut makes decisions on an on a 
almost a subconscious level, it means it's the most prone to bias. Your gut instinct is the one that is going to make decisions over and over based on what you know, what you like, what you think is right, as opposed to logic and reason. Got it. So your advice to a health club chain that, let's say, has 300,000 members uh, a year ago today and now has 100,000 members because all these people have canceled or they've bought a, uh, their own uh, Peloton bike or in order to track bike or bought a mirror uh, and you want to get them back, what, what would be your advice to start that conversation? I would say to get a random sampling of people and start making some calls and say, look, I absolutely understand. You do not have to defend your, ch your choice to leave the gym, but can you give me five or 10 minutes and give me your ideas on what might bring you back? Um, we really underestimate the power of crowds. We, again, I, I hate to keep hearkening back to research, but <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, is that research going back to the 19th century shows that a group of people, a random people with no expertise in the subject matter, actually are more accurate in their predictions and their decision making than even the most experienced expert that you have. Mm. So if you can crowdsource it, if you can start getting ideas from people who've left and said, what would bring you back? Just tell us. You might find that there are they they have ideas on how to make that happen. Um, and not only that, but those the power of the human voice to create empathic bonds that might uh that might spark some loyalty, that might, might make them rethink that decision, that you're a business, that there are people in your employ that you are also hurting during the pandemic, that might spark a feeling of, uh, I don't want to say guilt, but it might inspire them to say, you know what, here's something that I can do. Maybe I can go to a class where we're all distanced apart. Maybe what are they doing? You can get that information out there because they're just not going to pay attention to the email. Got it. So when you take a look at, you know, let's say you were became a consultant to a group and and your advice was, look, you have to call everyone. They'd say, Celeste, hey, you know, how can I call, you know, 200,000 people, you know, you don't have to. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, one, of, one of the one of the points I just want to get out there is that, you know, 200,000 people divided by the 1400 employees that you have is only, you know, X amount of calls. What is that? It's like. I don't know, hundred calls per person or something. That's a really say. good point. Right. So like some people view it as daunting until you kind of break it down to the granular level. And, and it, there, there should be relationships that get built, you know, not on email or not on text message. And I just wonder if, you know, the technology has gotten to the point where it, it becomes the, the sole solution. And, and I know you talk about this in, in some of your Ted talks, you know, about, what are you going to learn? Like, what, like if I'm going to go into a, a conversation, I want to learn something from the member that I don't already know. And I think a lot of clubs assume that uh, they put out an offer and that offer is going to be taken by a couple, you know, X percent of the people. And that's, that's like a positive marketing campaign when they didn't invest the time in actually understanding what resonates with people. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I want people to remember that is that when it comes to communication, we do not have tech that is better than our ears and our mouths. It just is not, we, it doesn't exist. In fact, I asked one scientist, is it possible that at some point written communication will be as effective as the voice in terms of relaying messages and creating those kind of bonds? And she said, it's possible in five to 10,000 years. We oh. have spent 300,000 years becoming the best communicators this planet has ever seen using our voices and our ears. We are biologically designed to communicate that way. And just because smartphones sprung up in 2007, we can't evolve that fast. It, it, we're just not there. And so in the meantime, the most effective way you have of reaching your members and, and getting information from your members is to talk to them. And you are correct that if you go into those conversations hoping to learn something, um, you're going to have a better communication. The other thing I would like to mention at this is that one of the phrases that almost every human being responds to in any culture and language is, can you help me? And mm -hmm. if 
the clubs are approaching their members or even former members that way. Can you help us out? We need some advice. You might hear, I'll give you a prime example. A woman down the street from me, she belonged to a boutique gym and she mm -hmm. quit as soon as the pandemic landed, of course. And they called her and they said, look, we're about to go under. What, what would help you? We don't want you to not work out during this pandemic. What would help you? And she said, you know what? I don't have any motivation. Can you help me get up and do exercises, even in my house? And they started a business of saying, okay, you give us your schedule. We're going we're gonna, to uh, text you on that morning with a PDF of the, your workout for that day for you to do at home. And that's become their way to stay afloat is that they found a bunch of their, their members weren't working out and they needed that extra boost. I have no idea. This is not my field of, you know, gyms is not what I do. But I, so I have no idea if that's practical for a lot of people, but it is an idea that they got by reaching out to someone who'd left. Got it. What's your thoughts on doing um, town hall meetings or doing group, you know, conversations or like you know, over bringing Zoom? Mem whether it's over Zoom or in person, do you feel like people are more apt to be honest in a group or, or more on a one on one type of call? They're, I mean, I, I, I think. Well, listen, people are going to be more honest with you when it's not a group, because when mm -hmm. you bring a group dynamic into it, then there's there's a performative aspect, right? Then they're worried about how they're coming off. Um, and it's also much more difficult to create a kind of connection between two people that makes me want to tell you the truth if they're spread out across a whole bunch of people. You and I are not going to get that connection. So, yeah, it should be a one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. So given, you know, that the woman down the block was was part of a boutique fitness gym are, are you do you belong to a health club or or a studio i do i belong to la fitness okay great is there, I haven't is there been any since june Got it. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're a client of ours um you know they, they take a relatively hands-off approach when you know member communication is not something that they're known for they're definitely known for a, a great place to work out um they outsource all their personal training they outsource most of what yeah. they do um do you view that people going forward are gonna are gonna want to be more self-directed or do you see after the pandemic people are gonna say you know i'm yearning for that community i think you're gonna have both Mm -hmm. Um, I think that people will be so anxious to get back into every place, the gym and everywhere else to find that feeling of normalcy even, yeah. um, that I think that's going to be a strong motivator for people. You know, I have, I haven't quit LA fitness. I still belong cause I am hopeful <laughs> and optimistic, even though I haven't been back, but I bought a mirror so that, which has been my lifeline during the pandemic so that I could keep working out at home. Um, I really like that. I don't see myself not using it anymore after the pandemic. And yet I will also be rushing back to my gym because I want to get that back. Um, so I think what you're going to find is that there's, there's some of both and there's no reason why gyms can't meet both of those needs. Right. Right. Yeah, some of the advice that we've been giving clubs is when people do come back, find out from them what fitness equipment they've they've purchased for their Absolutely. home. Absolutely. And actually like give them a prescription that includes yes. their home and not not look at it as like competitive. Like I don't want to have to call you up, Celeste, and say, Well, the reason why a mirror sucks is because XYZ. You know, I want to say, hey, look, that's awesome. Like, why don't you do these two workouts on the mirror? Why don't you do these three workouts in the club? And why don't you do this group exercise class? And, and instead of fighting technology, absorb it and, and work with it. Absolutely. And save time. Or, or, or if I get a notification this morning saying, if you're using your mirror, here's what you should do. If you're coming into the gym, here's a little suggested workout for you. Yeah. Um, that's worth it to me, especially that personalization. 
also helps with the fact that I have uh, horrible knees, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have been able to personalize at home in a way that you can't when I go to a class for the most time at the gym. So if, if gyms find a way, day to adapt to that, that again is about communication, which is two-way communication. That's a gym actually asking me what my needs are and then responding to them rather than the gym being prescriptive and saying, here's what you should do. We know more about fitness than you. Here's what you should be doing. Um, which actually, when when gyms do that to me, it actually makes me feel more distance from them. It makes me feel less like we're in a relationship because when they're when they're telling me what I should do, and in my mind I'm thinking, no, I shouldn't. That's not the right workout for me. I have horrible knees. Right. Um, that makes me feel like even even less relationship with my gym than if they'd done nothing at all. Got it. So some of the, the health clubs and boutique studio operators have so many members have never, it's not in the DNA and the culture yeah. to, base, to, to communicate, right? So after I listened to your TED talk, you know, it, it made sense to me. Some of the things I do, I need to improve on. Um, some of the points you brought up that everyone's an expert at something I thought was intriguing to me. How do you pivot a culture you know, to communication and caring when maybe the business model never really had that. Anytime that you're talking about culture, we um, like to think of culture only in the positives. In other words, we think here's what we do and this defines our culture. What we forget are here's the things that we don't do, which is also part of your culture. And here are the things we don't talk about. And again, mm -hmm. undiscussables, the things that are like the unspoken norms, that's also part of your culture. So in order to become a more, I guess more, you're saying a more caring organization, I would say the first step is honesty. You have to get a good picture of what your organization is, its personality, and its culture. That's how you change first, mm -hmm. is to figure out who you are and what you do, not just the proactive things, but these reactive things as well that make up part of who you are. Yeah, so like 15 years ago, um, there was a health club chain called uh, Bally's Fitness. Yeah. And, um, you know, Bally's was known to sell people three-year contracts and then, you know, have a heavy and, and pretty hard collection um, process in place. And someone was buying the company and they said to me, you know, what, what would you do with this company right now? And I said, the first thing I do is I take every sign down, I bring it into Central Park and I burn it and I do a public apology because this brand did not have a promise. Like they basically broke their promise and I'm basically burning that and I'm apologizing to everyone and we're going to put up a new brand. So do you think that in certain instances, there are brands that need to go away? and redefine who they are? Or do you think that they're rehabilitatable, if that's a word? I just made up that word. I like it, though. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that every brand is can be rehabilitated. But I one of my best examples, my favorite examples comes, I, I included in my book. Um, and it's Domino's Pizza. Mm -hmm. Because there came a moment in time when Domino's made a million dollar gamble multi-million dollar gamble. And basically they said, this must have been the early 2000s. Um, they said, look, we've done the surveys. Our pizza's terrible. We've eaten it. It tastes nope. terrible. And they did whole, a whole ad campaign. Do you remember this? I remember, Saying yeah. our pizza is awful, but we have spent the past years coming up with pizza that tastes really good. You don't have to believe us. Come in and try it. And if you don't like it, your pizza's free. I remember that. I remember that. Uh, and yep. every advisor was like, please don't do this. You're just basically trashing your brand. You are trashing your brand. But actually, it was one of the most phenomenal turnarounds anyone has ever seen. And it's that kind of honesty I'm talking about. Right. It's that kind of acknowledgement that these are the mistakes we've made. This is what we're doing well, which is what companies like to focus on, but they don't focus on actually being honest. People have relationships with their gym, especially. This is not just some ATM machine where they're going and making a, a, a faceless transaction. And they have a memory. 
if they have bad experiences, they remember that. You can't just, as a company, move on and pretend like it didn't happen. It's awkward. It's, a, it's upsetting. And so yeah. you need to acknowledge the mistakes that you've made and say, you know what? You're right. You are right. That was a screw up. And here's what we're doing to make this better. Yeah, I think that's great advice for, you know, companies that, that may be listening to this. Instead of saying, you know, I'm under new management, I'm under new ownership. I actually like take, take the elephant in the room and tell us why you're under new management, why you're under new, new ownership and call it out. Yeah, I think if you call it out for yourself, then it becomes one of your guiding principles to not screw up again. You know, yeah. you've actually made a public statement that that you can't reverse. So that's really interesting. What, what kind of work do you do directly? I know you, you you do a lot of public speaking. What do most companies bring you in for, or what do groups bring you in for? What are, what are they? What's like the the essence of the essence behind why they they have you come and talk to them? It's always some form of communication problem. So I I, I do a lot of sort of in depth workshops. Right now, a lot of my work is focused on diversity and inclusion. I also get called in to talk. To, you know what? It's funny because one of the workshops that I do with companies is I call it the elephant in the room. And oh, it's okay. about bringing out <laughs> those undiscussables that we're talking about here, finding out what someone's culture is and and letting sunlight be the best disinfectant. Um, I often work with people in terms of teamwork. Um, people have sort of the wrong idea about teamwork, but teamwork is actually what is going to lift your company up and above expectations, not hiring these transformative people, which is a mistake people make all the time. Um, creating better teams and getting people to work together is going to have a much bigger impact than any single hire that you make. And another thing that I, the final thing that I sort of get called in on is meetings. Uh, meetings are terrible. They're designed the way they were back in the 1940s and 50s. They're awful and we can do better. So uh, I, I help people transform the meetings that they have. That's great. Yeah, we, we invested in a company about 18 months ago called the Athlete Book. And it's solely focused on bringing Division One, Two, II, and Three athletes related to diversity hiring into the workforce, into health clubs and studios as, as their first career job. And it's picked up a lot of traction with Amazon, Tesla, NASDAQ, Oracle, JP Morgan, that are really, you know, focused on diversity and inclusion. I think, you know, an employee base of a company needs to have the demographic pie chart, if you will, um, or spectrum, as does your, your customers, or else you really, you know, it's like you're fielding a team that doesn't resonate with your fans, I guess is like right. the sports analogy. So do you think that do you feel like everything that's happened over the last year gives you confidence that, that it's going to happen? Or do you feel like it's something people are talking about now? I don't, you mean in terms of diversity and inclusion, I don't have a lot of confidence right now. Um, and the reason I say that is because when we research the current diversity and inclusion programs, you know, these workshops people have, yeah. um, we find that not only do they not work, but oftentimes they make racial discrimination worse. Um, when we, when you approach diversity and inclusion as some kind of checklist, uh, when you approach right. it as a liability problem, how do we manage liability by not getting sued for racial discrimination? Um, you're never going to solve it. Um, and I'm sure the company you invested in knows this already, but bringing people into a, a bringing non-white people into an organization that's not welcoming, that does not have a plan and systems in place to uh, make them feel included, to promote them, to empower them, you're just going to have high turnover. That's all that's going to be. So mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of confidence right now because uh, in order to make this this better, it's going to require transformative change. And companies are not great at that. <laughs> They're just yeah, not great understood. at that. Understood. Well, I think the, the you know, we use the term HALO, Health Active Lifestyle Outdoors. Um, and the fact that it is focused on sports and fitness, I would hope, change quicker than, than, than an average corporate job or, or a bank because I hope so too. I, I, I feel like the, the opportunities in our industry are more akin to, to athletes and athletes are more diverse on average than other groups. 
Um, so, so I do, I, but I do share your, your concern that it's something that people are talking about now. And I think a lot of companies kind of hope it goes away. Oh, I'm sure sure. because they want to go back to business as usual. And I bet you anything, um, we can talk about diversity, but in what ranks are it, are those non-white people in the executive level? Are they in right. manager and supervisor level? Or where are they in the organization? That's what really, you know, I always say, I, yeah, your statement of support for Black Lives Matter is awesome, but show me your organizational tree. Show me right. your C-suite. And that tells me if you're actually committed to diversity. Yeah, agreed. So uh, it, it was great having you on. Uh, we usually end each uh, podcast with a, a quote. So if you have any... Uh, good quotes that you live by or, or quotes that you like? Um, yeah, there's this great quote from a researcher named Nicholas Epley in Chicago. Um, and what he's talking about is how he's trying to encourage people to reach out to others. And he says, almost nobody waves, but everybody waves back, which is one of my favorite quotes. Cause it's just like, be the one who waves. I love it. All right. Well, that's as positive a ending as we're going to find. So I'm going to wave here, even though we're on audio, I'd wave back. Thank <laughs> and I'm you. I'm waving David. back. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, look, when we get a chance to um, get together in person, we host these Halo Academies that we've been doing virtually with executives. Uh, once the, the dust clears, we're going to start doing these in person. So we'd love to be able to coordinate with you and, uh, and have you come speak to executives to um, to do this uh, in person as well? Uh, sure, I'd I love, love to. I love what you're what you're doing, and I think it could create you know a lot of change much quicker than we can do it on our own. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Well, thanks to, for being on. How can how can they contact you? The easiest way is just my website at celesteheadley dot com, and my last name is H E A D, like your body part L E E. And your book is available there, right? Yeah, it's available great. everywhere. Awesome. All right, it was great talking to you. I'm glad uh, we got connected here. Yeah, let's, absolutely. Uh, let's do so. Where do you live, by the way? I live just outside D.C. Okay, all right. All right, so we'll hit you up when we get our uh, East Coast uh, Academy going. Yeah, absolutely. All the best awesome. to you. All right, likewise. Appreciate you. Bye. Thanks yeah. so much. Bye. As we continue to build our Halo Talks email notification database, want to offer you a free $10 instant gift card from our friends at Promotion Vault. Also to show you how easy it is to offer your members and prospects and clients the ability to get desired actions out of them and reward them in real time, go to halotalks.com, put your email address into the pop-up box, see how it works, get a free $10 gift card from us, and uh, keep listening and making everybody great.